Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. So hello, good evening uh, from New York. Good morning, good afternoon. Um, a warm welcome to you all. I'm Charlene Fong, and I'm so pleased uh, to have you joining us for this program today. So you want to sit on a board? Nuts and bolts of board service. I'm so pleased to serve as your host and moderator. We saw a really terrific uh, response to this topic from around the globe, and we hope this conversation will allow you to walk away with some clear action items and next steps for navigating pathways to a volunteer board position in your future. This program is aligned topically with the MIT Alumni Forum, which is a new series of online gatherings that address global challenges and the way MIT alumni are helping to create a better world. And this month's topic was around service and the launch of the MIT Alumni Better World Service Initiative. Some background on me, I've been uh, volunteering with MIT for quite some time now. I uh, serve with the MIT Club of New York in our regional area have been a volunteer since 2006 and served as executive vice president uh, in 2016, and then as president from 2018 to 2020. I also served on our MIT Alumni Association Board of Directors from 2014 to 2017, and on the Association Selection Committee. I also serve on some outside boards, including the New York Junior League and the Association of Junior Leagues International, uh, and served on their board from 2017 to 2019. I'm really pleased uh, tonight to have alongside me our two panelists, Natalie Lorenz Anderson and Carrie Bowie. Both have extensive experience serving on boards and serving in other volunteer leadership roles. And we're so grateful to them for joining us tonight to share about their experiences and opportunities as well as pass along their insights to those looking uh, for pipeline opportunities and for how to go about finding board service roles. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kerry to introduce uh, himself. Great, hey, thank, thank you Charlene for, for that and uh, really happy to be here. So just really quickly, I'm uh, Kerry Bowie, class of 94, I was 1E. Uh, environmental engineering and then uh, came back and did uh, Sloan or course 15 for my MBA in 06 um, and so worked in uh, semiconductor manufacturing and also worked in state government before starting my own consulting practice and now I actually run a couple of nonprofits so uh, I'm actually leading a couple boards but I'll talk about uh, more of the volunteer boards versus the one uh, ones that I established so uh, in terms of uh, board service, just to give you a little bit of, of the ones that I've worked with. Um, so coming out of uh, business school, I uh, actually joined a, a board uh, doing work uh, in healthcare, and I'm not even a healthcare person, uh, but it's a board called Global Medical Knowledge. Uh, I worked there uh, for, well, not didn't work there, I guess it was work or service. Uh, volunteered there for, for a couple years. Um, I then uh, joined the board of the Black Alumni of MIT, uh, and there I was the clerk. Uh, I was also the recording uh, secretary, and I was eventually uh, president uh, for a couple of years for the Black Alumni of MIT. Uh, I actually joined the uh, MIT Alumni Association Board. Uh, I was part of uh, my good friend Chiquita White's transition committee and served a one-year term there. Uh, then joined the uh, annual fund board uh, at the time that, that was his name uh, and I've just uh, rejoined the MIT Alumni Association uh, board as a term director uh, and I sit on both the graduate alumni council uh, and I sit on the finance committee and uh, I also sit on an outside board with the Museum of Science and so uh, I'm a, a member of the board of uh, museum advisors there. So I think I could dig into a little bit more, but uh, that's really sort of the work um, that I'm doing when I'm not uh, doing the work of, um, you know, the Majura Project, which is an entrepreneurship and innovation. It's a startup uh, accelerator uh, in partnership with the Boston Consulting Group. 
uh, and also doing uh, Browning the Green Space, which is the other nonprofit uh, where we're trying to get more black and brown people uh, into the clean tech world. So with that, I think I'll hand it back to you, Charlene. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. Um, well, we have a lot to get into with you a little later. So let's turn it over to Natalie to hear a little bit about her uh, board service and opportunities. Thanks, Charlene. Really appreciate it. And it's fun to see so many people and a lot of names that I know out there. So thanks for joining tonight. Um, I'm Natalie Lorenz Anderson, class of 84, uh, course 61. And when I left uh, MIT, I joined Booz Allen Hamilton and became a cybersecurity professional and expert and eventually partner in the firm. And was there until 2017, uh, retired then to pursue my passion for um, STEM outreach to underserved kids and also to help my husband with his uh, solar business, trying to commercialize a cool product line. And, um, also get my last child, you know, off to college. So I uh, had a lot of fun over those years. And um, I'll talk about some of how I got into some of the board service. But right now I'm on a, a little bit too much. Um, and I'm working to sort of re uh, reprioritize some of these. But let's see, looking, I'm just I had to do a chart to think about everything I'm involved in. So from a board standpoint, um, with um, MIT, I am working with it's not really boards, but it's the nominating committee for the corporation and visiting committees where it relates to alumni association or alumni of MIT. Um, I'm also on the board of the MIT Club of DC and serving as a class officer. Um, let's see, for Johns Hopkins University, I'm on the Whiting School of Engineering board and also the advisory board for the um, environmental health and engineering department. Um, with APSEA, which is a professional association, yet another kind of board. I am a former chair and vice chair, and now I'm serving on the nominating and uh, governance committees. I'm still on the education foundation board and some other things with them. Um, and then Society of Women Engineers, I'm on the conference advisory board where we help define the program for each year's annual conference that serves 10 to 20,000 people. And we also pick the keynote speakers. Um, with Girl Scouts, I'm a vice president on the board of the nation's capital. I'm laughing because it's, it's too much, but uh, anyway, it's a lot of fun. And then the Arts of Great Falls, um, I'm on the local arts uh, board. But then in the last two years, I've started working with corporations. And so um, I'm serving on a MIT technology startup called Ember Labs as a board member representing the VC that um, is investing in them and I participate with them. I'm also just recently selected to OPT, um, which is a wave power technology uh, company, and that's a publicly traded board. And then I was just invited to Lutron, uh, which is a privately, a family privately held board um, or company, I should say, I'm on their cyber advisory board. So a bit, a bit too much, but I don't do any other real work for a living right now. So it's manageable, but I am trying to reprioritize a little bit. So I think, I think I'll stop there. Well, thank you, Natalie. And we are going to get into sort of how do you prioritize. But first, um, I'm going to start off, start us off with some questions. And I do want to encourage uh, the audience to place your own questions into the chat, and we'll be modern, monitoring those. Um, but maybe we can take a step back and ask, what is a board? And why do organizations have a board? What is the function of a board? Um, Let's start with Carrie. Yeah, I, I think in, when I think of the boards that I'm uh, a part of, a lot of it is, you know, sort of fiduciary responsibility, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, all of those things in order from a finance or a financial perspective, uh, I think it's an advisory uh, piece. You know, all of my boards, and I saw one of the question, all of my boards are volunteer nonprofit boards uh, right now. Uh, oftentimes there's a president or an executive director uh, leading the day-to-day -day operations. You know, I think there is an opportunity to be a thought partner or also to give some oversight there. You know, so who, who, who checks the, the president? Who checks the, uh, the executive director uh, to, do, to do that piece? And so that's typically how I think of the, you know, the, the role 
you know, as I'm sitting on these boards. And I think it all sort of boils down to, you know, as, as I think of what the what I'm looking for as I bring on board members, um, and, it's, and it's different. You know, it's always come down to those resources of, you know, time, talent, treasure. And so it, it depends on what the nonprofit or the organization is, but oftentimes I you know, may need some other roll their sleeves up and, and get their hands dirty and do something that I don't have the time to do, or I just might need their expertise and their knowledge uh, in a specific uh, field where it doesn't take a lot of time, but they, they know where to draw the X. Uh, and so that, that's very helpful. Uh, and then oftentimes it's the, the treasure piece. Uh, not for the ones that I'm working on, but I'm definitely part of boards where, you know, I sort of pay <laughs> to, to be a part of the board. Uh, that's a little bit of it. Uh, but in, in volumes, those are ones with more numbers. It can actually help to sort of bridge a little bit of that divide, especially for, for smaller ones, or to just show that people are, you know, really vested, you know, sort of like free programming. You, know, you may or may not show up, you know, if you pay. Uh, you know, it, 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 it means a little bit more. Uh, and so that's how I typically think of it. Thanks, Carrie. Natalie? Those were excellent, Carrie. I think you covered so much uh, important ground there. So um, I won't retread the, uh, the nonprofit space too much. I just wanted to kind of add there that as, as I think about the nonprofit space, um, there are differences, you know, whether it's a youth development organization, like for me, SWE or Girl Scouts, or whether it's an association like AFSIA, or whether it's a um, you know club like the MIT Club of DC, or it's an education you know like MIT or Hopkins types of things, you know there are definitely differences. And Carrie explained well when you're thinking about um, the organizations that are youth development, definitely the treasure part comes into play quite a bit. But they're also looking for us to provide our talents and also our network. Um, when you get into the um, association boards, sometimes there, they don't ask us to pay to play, but they are actually inviting many, many, many people to be on those boards because it's sort of a reward for companies that invest in that association. So with AFSIA, we have, it's way too big of a board. When you look at it from a fiduciary standpoint, it's a hundred um, members. Um, so then they have an executive committee that's a lot smaller. And then as Carrie said, there's a lot of committees. So on the for-profit side, um, the board is much more focused on the fiduciary. I mean, that is really the point of a, a, an official corporate board is the fiduciary responsibility. And it's to the shareholders, not just to the corporation, but if there are shareholders that have stock um, or if there are VC or equity firms that are investing, it's really the fiduciary responsibility to be sure that um, as a board member, you're asking all the right questions. And there they talk about um, noses in, fingers out. So you're supposed to be super nosy and ask a lot of questions, but you're not supposed to be you know, twiddling around and doing the work. I will tell you though, that for startup companies like MIT startups, um, they're, they're really happy for you to also get involved at some level. And I've gotten the opportunity to network, to engage other people with them, and also to provide cyber you know, expertise, for example, since that's what I bring, or to connect them to DOD markets or whatever. So um, I think that's all I would add. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, quite a range of responsibilities or uh, involvement. So we'll get into some of that. Maybe we could pop back to sort of nonprofit space and nonprofit board work. Um, if you could think back to your first board opportunity, uh, can you share maybe how that came up, came about? And maybe if it, especially if it was a nonprofit organization, did you um, start there, start getting involved in a different way? Did you start as a volunteer? Um, what was that interaction like? Yeah, so, and, and maybe I'll talk a little bit more about, well, I'll talk, I think all of them, and in a sense, are relational. Uh, there, there typically is somebody who brings you in. Uh, there was a personal connection. So if I think of Global Medical Knowledge, it was my good friend, Michael Maltese. I met him, I think he was the, um, the managing director of the Legatum Center, and I was, I, you know, brought me in, and I, I mentored first. Like you said, I had a, had a mentee, and then, um, you know, that was a different organization, and he asked me to join the board of a, a nonprofit that he had started. Uh, but if I think of the black alumni of MIT, you know, that was through, if I think of it, my good friend, who's now a professor, uh, Crystal Jones-Prather, 
I was in a barbecue in her backyard. And to Natalie's point, sort of asking questions about different things and, you know, not necessarily poking around, but asking questions. And the then president of the board, I think, uh, Martin Mbaya, uh, class of, I think, double O, um, you know, asked me, we started talking, uh, and oftentimes you'll get more involved in, in other things and you have other roles, but uh, got involved in helping out and then, you know, next thing I knew I was the clerk. <laughs> and then after that, I was the recording secretary. Uh, and then I ended up uh, as, as president. And so, you know, I, I think it's a lot of that piece. And even as I think of, I'm doing three, but I'll, I'll stop. But I think of the Museum of Science uh, similarly. Uh, and that was through an MIT connection. Um, you know, Bill Ouellette is at the Martin Trust Center now, but uh, when I was at Sloan, it was Ken Morris. And so I was at an event with my wife uh, and actually uh, through his wife, Laura Morris, uh, she was a trustee at the Museum of Science. So we just met and over a few years, you know, got to know each other. And then she asked me uh, to join the uh, Board of Overseers, now the now Museum Advisors at the Museum of Science. And so I, I think it is that uh, you're usually just interested in doing things and people see that uh, and they, they pull you in. I think that's really, yeah, Carrie, I, I totally agree. I, I'll never really know who, who or how it came about that I ended up on the MIT Alumni Association board, you know, those many years ago, but I will tell you that I had been so active with MIT in several roles, not only as class officer throughout the different reunion years, but um, through Booz Allen. I mean, this is a big deal for my company to, uh, at the time to connect. Well, it was my idea, but, you know, they really liked it to connect with my universities for talent acquisition, but also for R&D interactions. And so I also was getting really involved with CSAIL, with the um, Industrial Liaison Program. When MITE was formed, we joined MITE, um, the MIT, sorry, the MIT Energy Initiative, for those that may not know that acronym as deeply as I've had to live it. Um, IDSS, Institute for Data, Society and Systems, I think I have that right. You know, I got my company to invest on the ground floor of IDSS. And so, I mean, all of those things, I think, make it so that you get recognized somehow or another. And, and having served then on the nominating committee in later years, I recognize that so much of the conversation is, you know, are people really invested in MIT? Are the alumni doing things, whether it's class officer stuff or, you know, something like BAMIT, like Carrie is doing, or whether it's, you know, getting involved from a more business side or, you know, there's, there's just so many ways to get involved at MIT. So that that's one big way is just being well connected, talking to your friends, expressing interest in having roles and serving MIT, you know, eventually the board of directors nominating committee notices and, and you know, probably taps you on the shoulder. For the others, um, it was really also through business, you know, the Girl Scouts and Society of Women, Eng Women Engineers. I have personal interest in those because I was a Girl Scout and I was a SWE member, but it was because I thought Booz Allen should be involved with them. And, you know, so again, it's getting in there, getting those relationships going, making a difference, having impact. And then, you know, people start to say, well, hey, I think you should be on our board, you know. Um, so those are, you know, just to add a little bit more dimension to that. Okay, thanks. I heard you say uh, expressing interest is a really important one, letting people know that you are available um, with time. <laughs> Uh, and of course your expertise. So I just wanted to underscore that. Um, talking about sort of, you know, both of you have spoken a little bit about just what your general interests are and why that brought you to where um, you've been serving, but maybe you could talk about some other considerations that really motivate you to serve in so many different ways and capacities. Yeah, I guess I can, I'll, I'll keep going. We'll switch next time, Natalie. You can, okay. I'll, I'll let you go first. <laughs> um, so, so I think there is a piece, you know, like I said, and what Charlene was just brought up, Charlene bring, bringing up is, is the interest piece. And so I think of all the things I do in three buckets, it's, you know, it's uh, entrepreneurship and innovation, it's diversity, equity, and inclusion, or it's energy, you know, and the environment. And so it's really easy to do things that are in those uh, spaces because there, there are things that I'm going to be uh, involved in as well. I think there is also this this thought of uh, giving back. You know, I grew up 
you know, my mom was a teacher, my dad's a Vietnam vet, you know, it's, you, you, you know, sort of, what is it, the Spider-Man or whatever, to whom much is given, much is, you know, require, required. Uh, so just wanting to give back, and the more I'm getting there, and it's sort of like Natalie said, the social capital piece, sometimes it starts to get a lot easier because you've been in all these places, you know a lot of people, it's really easy for you to do simple things that can, you know, move the needle a lot uh, for an organization or a startup or, a, or you know, as you move up or for a large corporation. Uh, and, and it may even be, you know, some of it comes from things where it's, you know, may not be a traditional board. You know, it's serving at your faith-based organization. You know, I was, you know, chair of the business and finance committee at my church. And they're probably like, well, you have an MBA, you can come help us with this. And then sometimes you're not, you don't even volunteer. Sometimes you get pulled in. You know, people know you have a tool set and they'll bring you in and you're like, well, I can, I can help. Uh, and typically you just get in and you usually don't lead. You know, I didn't come in to chair the, my business and finance committee at my church. I was just a member. And I probably sat back for a couple of years, uh, like Natalie said, asking questions. Like, why are we doing this? <laughs> why does this happen? What's going on? You ask enough questions, people will turn around and say, well, fix it. <laughs> you know, or you know, why don't you, you know, go and go and work on that? So I think those are some of the things uh, that that motivate you uh, to do it. And also just going back, you know, if I think of, you know, the black alumni of MIT, it's, well, of course, I'm an alum, then I want, you know, to see more students come in. I want to support the students when they're there. I want to su support alumni after. Uh, and there are very, you know, different ways to do that and really getting people organized around those different pieces. Again, well said, Carrie. <laughs> and I love the way that you describe, you know, the three buckets that kind of get you engaged, um, because it reminds me that I, I think about it the same way. You know, for me, when I left, well, while I was still at Booz Allen, I was really interested in, um, you know, youth development in cybersecurity and STEM topics. And so I naturally gravitated toward organizations that would help me find diverse people, you know, especially women, but also people of color that were coming up through and try to, and if they weren't, if there weren't enough, let's, let's see what we could do to help even at the K through 12 level. So it drove me further and further into the point where when I retired, I wanted to work on the K-12 situation because I felt that that was really a, a missing link. And um, you know, there's a little bit of a digression from the MIT side of it, but I ended up, uh, my son was at TJ High School, which is an S&T school here in Virginia. And you know, when we got there, and I like Carrie, I had simple, you know, simpler beginnings. You know, I I I had a single parent, and she, you know, worked super hard trying to keep the household going. And so, you know, being a person that got a scholarship to go to MIT and also grants and loans and stuff, you know, I'm looking at the kids that are getting into TJ and the kids that aren't, and thinking, well, there's something wrong here. You know, we're not getting kids from half of the pyramids in Fairfax County, and that's a problem. So all I did was put my hand up to work on the diversity committee. And two years later, I'm chairing the partnership fund board, which is the fundraising arm of TJ. But I only agreed to do that if they let me have a K-12 STEM committee so that I could continue my mission to reach out to these schools and help educate parents and get these kids excited about applying and then help them get in. So anyway, kind of a digression, but you know, it's back to that point where it almost never starts that you want to be on the board. It's it's almost always that you have this passion around, you know, cyber, STEM, youth, you know, diversity, and you know, you end up just throwing yourself into it, and people want you to, you know, do more. Yeah, that um, that leads me to think about, you know, you're you're both talking about spaces that you want to have an impact in that you care a lot about that maybe you want to see some type of change and that's why you start getting interested in these organizations and we have a question that sort of asks like besides satisfaction what do you really what do you get from serving on these boards and I think you're touching on this a little bit which is to say that you're working towards some change or or evolution maybe um, but maybe both of you could speak to that a little bit more sort of why? Yeah, it's a great question. I'll take Carrie up on going first this time. <laughs> it's a great question. It's, um, 
for me, it's almost the world's problems are almost overwhelming. I think back to a movie long ago where the woman is overwhelmed because of all the all the world's problems, right? And I think sometimes I'm like that character in that movie because I, I do care desperately about climate change. I care desperately about education and especially for our underserved kids in our in our world. And, you know, I care about energy and renewable energy. I mean, there's so many things and it's really hard almost to se separate that out. So I, I decided um, more recently in the last few years that I really want everything I do to align kind of most of those. So if I'm doing K-12 STEM outreach and it's about climate topics and renewable energy topics, and it's working toward getting kids excited and getting them into education and careers eventually in those spaces, I feel like that's something that's worthy. So it's been helpful to have that guideline because you can get overbooked, overcommitted. Um, you know, so that, that's a way that I start to think about. And so what does that do for me, I guess is what the real question was. Well, it's, it's just this soul, I, it's my soul needs <laughs> to do something about these problems. And it's just my decision was that a way to do it is I can't do it all myself. I'm never gonna be that smart or capable to solve these problems myself. But if I can help the youth in our country, get really jazzed about it and give them the tools, then, you know, we're actually creating maybe thousands of people that can do things instead of just me trying to do something mm -hmm. halfway. Yeah. And, and, and Charlene, I, I think for me, um, I think the two that naturally come, you know, following up on what Natalie was saying, I think it's sort of, you know, heart, soul, but there's also a head piece, you know, and so I think there's, you know, you get into it because I'm passionate about something and it makes me feel good. And then from a heart perspective, and a lot of these, I'm like helping, you know, so if I can get more black and brown kids into the Museum of Science, if I can get more um, young people to, um, you know, matriculate to MIT and to be not just, especially, you know, students of color, not just survive, like I think I did, I sort of, I got through and, and, and but, but to thrive. Um, like that makes a difference. You know, I talked about my friend, Crystal Jones Prather. Um, a, a while back, we helped to, um, you know, get a fund set up. Uh, and so we can help with the interface program. And so I got to, you know, do that. But, and that comes back to that head piece. You know, I'm an engineer, I'm an environmental engineer. I worked the Mass Water Resources Authority and Texas Instruments doing semiconductor manufacturing. So I love getting my hands dirty and, you know, stick it in water and sewage and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I have an MBA from Sloan in entrepreneurship and finance, but I can go into investment banking or investment, you know, management. You know, I wasn't sort of jockeying spreadsheets. And so I wasn't doing a lot of that, even though I was sort of trained in it. I actually got to do it through my volunteer work, you know, so sitting, you know, at the business and finance committee of my church, I'm going through, I'm looking at financials. I'm looking at all those things uh, for BAMIT, you know, looking at that piece and dealing with not just technical issues as typically as an engineer, but legal and financial issues. So I'm, you know, sharpening my, my chops there. Um, you know, like I said, I was on the annual fund board at the MIT Alumni Association. So thinking about how do we go and raise money? You know, I was the, you know, co-chair of our 25th year reunion committee. So going and saying I can raise over a million dollars or, or, or more, uh, and doing the, you know, right now I'm on the finance committee of the MIT Alumni Association, but also doing that on the audit committee of the Museum of Science. So I'm, I'm getting to see plenty of spreadsheets um, and, and that's great because it allows me, it's very easy to go out and if I want to go and raise funds. So I'm now doing that with the two nonprofits, no big deal. Like I've, I've been doing it, uh, you know, and so for the organizations that I've done, it's helped me with that. You know, I can still remember when Gwil York uh, she was a trustee of the Museum of Science, but she asked me, did you want an audit committee? I said, the audit committee? Oh, really? I was like, that sounds just so, it was so amazing. It's amazing the things that you have to do uh, to go through and, and support and the people coming in, thinking about, you know, Natalie, thinking about cybersecurity, thinking about, you know, as we go through and there's a pandemic, you know, like how do you think you have to make tough decisions? Uh, and so being, you know, there when all of that happens uh, really is, is great. And so in a sense, it's learning, you know, so when, you know, hopefully this is a win, win, win for 
and I think I saw a question in the chat about fiduciary responsibility. Is it about you know the you know success of the organization or the impact? It's it's not either or. You know, it's it's both and. It's like how how do you uh, support the work that these organizations are doing, uh, really on the impact? But if they're not sustainable, then it's not really any good. You know, if they can only last for a year, and and they're fully reliant on, you know, gifts and donations, uh, and really haven't gotten that process down, then it's not going to be long lived. You know, SWE and the Girl Scouts and all that, they're going because they have sustainable business model. They may rely on some donations and grants, uh, but they're, 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 running a, they're running tight ships. Yeah, great. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Natalie. I think a lot about uh, when I work with volunteers, when I'm serving on a board, but really developing volunteers, I always ask them, well, what do you want to get out of this? What skill set do you want to build? And how can we help you? Because the more we can engage our board members and our volunteers, the better, you know, the more rewards the organization gets as well. So I think, you know, the win-win conversation is, a, is an important one. And I think also with some smaller nonprofits, maybe bigger ones as well, they love having someone who's not perhaps in a financial space so they can ask the questions, the different questions, see things differently, or they might put someone who is in finance in the HR space so that they can ask those questions and look at it differently. Um, from my experience, that's what I've seen. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, so you've talked a lot about what we can get out of it, what is so um, meaningful about your experiences, but I think a lot of people wanna know, how do you position yourself for board opportunities? Um, I know we spoke about networking and working through some of that, but maybe for those who are a little greener in their professional lives, what, what could they, um, how could they be approaching this? Maybe for those who are in a different industry and maybe would like to serve across into another space, what kinds of advice do you have for those folks? Charlene, I, I love that question. And I saw a lot of questions in the chat that sort of get at various pieces of this. So it, I assume it's okay if we talk about it, not just from the uh, nonprofit, but also the corporate board yeah. standpoint, okay. Yeah, because you know the question. I think it was Paul that asked. Uh, you know, is it MIT alumni were so? I don't know. Maybe I don't know if it's modest. He didn't say it that way. But you know, we don't think about like approaching something that we need to go get a board seat, right? And I and I think about that too because most of the board seats that I've gotten in nonprofit world were accidental, built on relationships and service. The corporate board work is a whole different ballgame, and it was very awkward and strange. Because, well, I did actually invest in um, joining a couple of organizations. There's Women in the Boardroom based in New York, and there's um, National Association of Corporate Directors. Unfortunately, they both cost, you know, some money. But when you think about it in the grand scheme of things, if you get a board seat, it's going to pay for itself in the first few months of service. Um, but it still was, you know, a, a big ticket item at first. And what they teach you in all of that is first you need to make sure that you feel confident in your skills. So a lot of your nonprofit work does carry over very much so, but a lot of it doesn't um, because it's a very different ball game when you're talking about fiduciary responsibility for a publicly traded company than you are for maybe a $20 million per year budget nonprofit or a small club or association. So um, the difference is skill developments so that you gain some confidence. And then it also is really putting yourself out there. You know, they teach you to go and talk to your network and ask questions about you know, what they're doing, maybe find out what boards your friends and, and colleagues and associates are serving on, do some homework. If you're on your nonprofit boards, almost everybody sitting on those boards with you is also part of a corporation or part of you know, maybe for, for-profit corporate boards. So it's, you, know, you, you kind of dig through your network, you look and see what else they're doing, ask, really ask for help getting connected, um, ask them if there's a cycle coming up when the board is going to be looking at nominating new members, figure out if you have a skill match, and you know, ask for an introduction to the nominating and governance committee chair if if it really feels like a good match. And yes, it's awkward and it feels weird and you know um, all of that. But after you do it a few times, you start to realize that hey, it's just like any other job interview. 
if you feel like you're qualified and and in it and the mission of that organization matters to you, then you know you you make it a serious ask and um, put your best foot forward. So I'll stop there. There's a lot more to it than that, but I, it answers some of it, I hope. Yeah, and and I would you know add especially one just you know you know sort of you you what is it you crawl before you you know walk and walk before you run. Sometimes it's just you know especially at the nonprofit level you, you just get involved and you, you you help you join as a member of a committee or you join the organization and you show up to events and you you know you join zooms and you see what's going on and you you, you follow the, the folk and you see what's going on and then you can take a little bit more of a leadership do you start to chair a committee uh, and then you know that piece can come up and I think even as you we talk about corporate boards you know I think there is a there's an intermediary in between going from sort of a nonprofit to a large corporate, you know, you know, especially, you know, we're MITers. There are plenty of startups um, who could really and we probably need to figure something out. That's a great way to do that connecting. Um, like I do a lot a little bit through my Majura project. A lot of what I do is, you know, it doesn't start with you, you know, like us placing you on a board. We, you know, there's a 30 minute conversation with somebody in your space, you know, who is interested in what you're doing. And then you, if it clicks and it works and it feels right, um, they might ask you to come on as a board member. And, you know, you get a couple of points. Uh, and now, you know, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's not guaranteed. It's, you know, you get points and if something takes off, you, you're compensated. You know, often the corporate boards, you need it to be around and, you know, more deeply involved in, in what you're doing. And I saw one of the questions in the chat, you know, hey, if you're, you know, you've been helping out, it may not necessarily translate over. I mean, you can talk to them about it, but it, it's, it's sort of, it depends. You know, sometimes that will work, sometimes it, it, it doesn't. And if they, if they value it and think that that makes sense, uh, then you go that route. If not, you you walk away, and it's sort of what is it? You can lead a horse to water, you know, but you can't make him you know drink. I think I, there was another question in the chat about man, you know that they can do better, and they can if they did X, Y, and Z, it would do it, but you can't force them to do it. Um, if they want to be where they are, it's where they they are where they are. You can make recommendations and you can suggest and you can influence. Um, it's, it's not like it's corporate where you can do a hostile takeover, <clears throat> you know, of a, of a nonprofit. Yeah, I think you just have to start your own. And that's something else. You know, it's almost you, you can do that. You can start your own organization. Um, but I understand not wanting to necessarily compete in this place. Um, but, you know, I'm a business guy. There are probably, you know, in my mind, I... I think there are probably too many nonprofits. You know, I wish we could do some mergers and acquisition, acquisitions and consolidate more like in the business world. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily happen. You just have to do really well and maybe it works out. It's not as it's not as quick uh, as in the business world. If, if I can add on on the advisory board question and, and corporate board question, you know, some some of the chat and also picking up on what you said, Carrie. That there's two examples um, that I have in my world, and I've heard other people's examples, but I'll focus on mine. The, the way I got onto that very first um, startup board, actually, I had been an advisor to an MIT startup before that, and then they got acquired, and I didn't uh, have my ducks in order enough to have stock in that first board. So, you know, I got a little bit of a, a payout when they uh, got acquired, which was kind of fun, actually. But anyway, the, the first one was because I was actually a limited partner in a venture fund. And it happens to be um, one of the uh, managing partners is an mit -er, and I happen to know him. And so we just, you know, we got talking over the years and I, I ended up being an LP. And then I actually introduced this company to them and they ended up investing in this company and they don't have that many partners in their firm and they've got like 40 some odd companies in their portfolio. So it's kind of dumb luck in a way. I was in the right place at the right time. The CEO, she liked me because I introduced her to them and got funded. They liked it because they know me already. And so I ended up getting to be a, a director, but it's a funny one because I'm not independent and I don't work for the VC. So it's, it's a funny one. Um, and then the other one, the family owned company, 
I was introduced by another MIT alum friend of mine in this area, a class of 85, our friend, to the uh, CEO of that company because he does some work for them. And I did a little bit of advising on, a, on an hourly basis, and I just didn't think it was going to turn into anything. And a year later, they invited me to be on their cyber advisory board, and it's a paid position. You know, you get paid for each day that you're doing. It's only three meetings a year, but, you know, it's kind of cool. And so I don't know that I'll ever be on the board board for that company, but it's still really relevant to be on the advisory board doing cyber stuff. It's really cool. And it'll help build my bona fides for future opportunities, frankly. Uh, both of you have named some not board board positions. Um, could you speak to a little bit about the different types of boards, advisory boards, and then in the nonprofit area, maybe their associate boards, et cetera. Can you share a little bit about what those opportunities are for the folks here? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. And so I just sort of said my traditional boards, but I'm, I'm on a number of advisory boards that I just see very differently. Like I didn't go, didn't have to go through all the paperwork, you know, I, I or, or different things. So I sit on the advisory board of the lab fund. And so it's a, a fund um, out of out of Sloan, you know, targeting investments in sort of black and Latinx uh, founders. Uh, I'm part of the Sloan Impact or SI Ventures uh, advisory uh, group that's doing some, you know, similar similar work. Uh, there is a Boston Ujima project uh, that's sort of a grassroots investing in communities. I'm part of the investment committee uh, for for that. And so I'm still doing things, but I'm not I'm not a board member. You know, I'm part of an advisory committee. I'm part of an investment committee. And so there is work to do. And for me, this goes to this. This hits my, you know, my my DEI uh, bucket and it hits my entrepreneurship and innovation bucket. I'm getting to think about investing in founders of, of color and I can help because of the work that I've been doing and the things that I understand and being able to open up my networks and and make connections. Um, but it's, it's, I, I don't feel like I have the same responsibility. You know, I, I'm not, we're not, we may be taking votes, but we're not taking, you know, formal, you know, board votes. And like the investment committee with Ujima, we send that up, you know, it's, it's more a democratization process. So we actually send it to the community. You know, we give a recommendation and then the community gets to vote uh, on it. And so it's not really, we're just making a recommendation. And so I think that those are where things sort of typically happen. The board actually really like votes on things oftentimes. Advisories, you just sort of advise. <laughs> you're sort of cons consulting, advising, you're not making the, the decisions per se. Anything to add, Natalie? Yeah, I was thinking about this too from the standpoint that, you know, Carrie mentioned earlier that a lot of the work gets done in committees. So as you think about the committee structure, you know, not just advisory committees, right? Which I think that this advisory committee for cyber, I will be doing work <laughs> with a couple of other really interesting people that are also on it. But, you know, when you think about the nonprofits, um, the board, you know, if they're running well, often the board doesn't do the work. They're meeting to, you know, review the work of the committees and then making decisions. And, you know, um, they also have the responsibility, we haven't talked about it much, but in addition to the fiduciary responsibility of things like budget committees and audit committees and things like that, they have the responsibility for the leadership of that organization. And that happens through compensation committee where you're actually reviewing the um, work of the CEO or executive director and making decisions about their compensation and also possibly their next tier of people. But you're also on the NomGov, and you know, there's also NomGov committees or nominating and governance committees. And the nominating committees focus on bringing new board members in and governance committees focus on policy and other facets of governance um, beyond fiduciary. So most nonprofits have some combination of some of those at some level and um, and most of the work is being done there. So it can be a great way to get your toe in. I saw some people asking about how do you get your toe in, you know, to offer to be part of those committees. And most organizations, you don't have to be on the board to be part of most of those committees. I mean, there's rules for audit and uh, some of the core com committees, but 
an awful lot of these organizations, you can actually serve on the committee as well, even though you're not on the board. And that can be a great avenue then to get invited to the board if they see how you work and they like what you do and how you think. So one, one thing to add there. I saw a few questions earlier, sort of getting at uh, sort of maybe I'll call them sticky situations, uh, maybe uh, dynamics on a committee are operating in a less professional, less than professional manner. Um, maybe that's because we think we're in a nonprofit space different. I'm not sure there. Um, I'm sort of interpreting these questions. And I saw another question about, you know, if there seems to be a mismatch between what you thought a position was going to be and, you know, the reality. So a few sticky spots there. How might you approach these situations? Well, I, I mean, I'll start there. I, I've, I guess I've been fortunate that I've never been specifically part of a, a, a dysfunctioning board per se, but you know, I've been in situations like 20 years ago um, when I was uh, on a couple of nonprofit boards. One was the MIT club in my local area and the other one was uh, AFSIA, their lunch speaker series type of thing, right? Well, I was also pregnant with my youngest and it just, it, it became really clear that I just, and I had, I had twin teenagers and I was working 60 hours a week at my job. So it became clear that I, it was, it was not possible for me to commit and do everything I thought you should do. Neither of those organizations necessarily asked me to stop, but I really felt like it just wasn't fair to them. I felt like there's other people lined up who want to be on those boards. So I pulled myself out. It wasn't hard to do that. And even today, as I think about being overcommitted, some of these nonprofit or, or university boards I've been on for over 10 years. And again, there's people lined up that would love to do it. So I've been careful about how to do it. You know, I talked to the board chair first and then talked to the executive director or CEO that brought me in 10 years ago or more. But, um, you know, it has not been hard to have those conversations. The only time I felt like there was really a problem, thankfully, I was actually the chair of the board and it was the CEO that was the problem. And I was able to help them. They had been around for 50 years at this point. So, of course, everybody thought they already knew how to do everything. And I, I came in with different thoughts and uh and I said, you know, it's really weird that you've never had a CEO um, compensation discussion. You've never had an, an evaluation of their performance. Um, so if you're not happy, a lot of the members weren't happy with what that person was doing. I said, well, then you need to have a formal assessment and you need to do it 360, like all the people that they deal with. And then you need to have a compensation discussion and you need to, you know, counsel this person. And I, I felt good about it because it wasn't under my watch because we only had two year chair terms, but the next chair after me, who was my vice chair, was able to finally um, push that person out <laughs> and hire, you know, this excellent new CEO. So, you know, it was fun to be able to be in a position where I could actually make that decision that we were not going to put up with it. Yeah, I, I think there are sort of a couple of things. I definitely have been part of boards where there have been issues and, you know, like I said, it's sometimes technical legal and financial you know I, I love it when it's not as much legal uh pieces that go on but every now and again um you know they do uh and i think you just have to <clears throat> deal 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 with it and you you work through it uh, i think you need to know what it is that you want to do i think most of the time now especially non non-profit boards now i'm you know a lot of people are asking me and i'm saying no because i just don't have the capacity and the, and the bandwidth, uh, it really needs to be something where I'm going, wow, this really, really aligns. Or it's sometimes, it's, you know what, this is something, it aligns, but it's not what I'm doing right now. It's, it's, it's different. And I think I can add value. And I think that was in the, you know, the chat from a few folk. You know, just like we talk about cross-disciplinary things, so much of this stuff, regardless of what industry you're in, it can translate. And so sometimes it's, you, you can bring a lot when you're coming from another industry. You're in a sense sort of, you know, fresh eyes um, that you're bringing to the table. And so I think that's important. And so it might be, you know, you're, you know, during the day you're over here doing this and you know what, evenings and weekends you're doing this. <laughs> because that might be, you know, I would hope you're aligned <laughs> and everything, you're just passionate about everything that you're doing, uh, but you might just, you know, you may compartmentalize a little bit and go, 
this is what I'm good at doing, but I'm passionate about this piece and I do it. And I actually think it can bring you back to, you know, real alignment on what you're doing uh, because you get to see that, man, there's an opportunity that this is, you know, valuable. This thing that I'm passionate about is, is valuable and you can bring another, you know, take to it. You know, maybe it is nonprofit, but you're like, man, there's an opportunity. There was a for-profit opportunity to do something here. Uh, and you know what, maybe there's a gap and I need to fill it. And so I think, um, you know, it's, you know, I, I think, I still think lead with your heart. I think you need to think <laughs> your head can't be too far behind or, or you're going to land on your butt. Uh, but, but I think you definitely, you know, need to, you know, think about your passion and, and really follow that. Charlene, if I can add something, I, I've seen some questions that kind of dig in more about how do you find out about these opportunities in the first place? And yeah, a lot of it is word of mouth and, and being well connected and, and putting yourself out there time-wise to meet up with people in your network is, is helpful. You certainly don't want to do it as a self-serving thing. You want to make sure that you're off, also offering to help them if you're having a conversation about how they might help you. But some of these, like um, the professional associations, they do in fact well, most of them, I guess I can't say they all do, but they, the ones I'm involved in, they do have a time of year when it's known that the committees are open, you know, for nominations. And a lot of them even have the nomination forms online. So sometimes you, you can actually find that out, um, but you can always try, you can always find out the fiscal year of a nonprofit. And you can always find out with publicly traded companies because they're registered with the SEC. You can find out who all their board members are, what the time of year is that they're doing their nomgov. So it's findable, it's work, it takes work. But if you kind of know where you want to focus, whether it's a topic or whether it's a community you want to be involved in with a little bit of um, legwork, you can try to narrow down when should you be even investing time and in trying to then talk to people who are in that world. Yeah, I'll just add that goes, you know, something that goes with that legwork is, you know, once you're interested or you have some focus making sure that the nonprofit is, I think Carrie spoke about, you know, you don't, I don't think anyone walks into a nonprofit wanting to deal with maybe legal issues or financial issues. And there's sometimes ways to prepare yourself to know whether, you know, a, an organization is in good standing and is the right choice for you. And so it, it takes some of that research work. Yeah, but I yeah. did, um, oh, go ahead, Carrie. Well, I just add one thing on that. Just like if you're in, being interviewed, for a position, you ask questions too. You know, don't, don't, yeah. you know, fools rush in where, what is it, angels dare not tread. Ask questions, <laughs> you know, see, you know, what are you really about? What's your mission? You know, can you talk a little bit about your financials? What is the financial health? You know, so don't, don't walk into anything from a board position where you do that. And I, I think one of the last questions I saw was, you don't have to be a board member. You can just be a volunteer. You know, just help. You don't, don't, you know, you don't have to take on that added responsibility if you don't, if you're not ready or don't want to. Um, you just, just volunteer. Um, I am watching our time. We have just about five minutes left. Uh, I think what I always like to ask is um, if you have some advice for your younger self or those here things that you wish you had known. I know you already shared so much wisdom with everyone here tonight, but if you could pinpoint one or two things, um, I'd love for you to share that with us tonight. I'll start. Um, I think you've already heard me say that I would tell my younger self just to be careful not to get too overcommitted. I mean, to me, life is like a kid in the candy store, if you like candy. And, uh, you know, there's just so much. And you know, there's not enough time. So it's always a problem for me, but I, I manage it every year. I go through the process of figuring it out. But, but more importantly, the advice I would give my younger self is that you, know, you, you probably don't ever want to serve in any position, whether it's a corporate leadership position or a nonprofit or a corporate board for too long. You know, Maybe, I mean, three to five years, you've probably given it your best thoughts. You probably are not going to keep giving it wonderful new thoughts, right? And so you need to have a succession plan just like you would do for the CEO or executive director of whatever that organization you're serving, you want to have them have a, CEO, a succession plan, but you should for yourself. And you should communicate that with the chair you know, of the organization, whatever you're involved in. And be sure you're working toward training the next people so that there's somebody else competent to step into your role. That, that's what I wish I had known earlier in my life. <laughs> 
Yeah, and and some the same, some opposite. I, I would say I wish I would have leaned in a little bit more, you know, at the beginning. You know, I think when I was in corporate, like I would go to work, I would play pool and drink and hang out and just have fun. I was like, there are plenty of places when I was in Dallas. I probably spent about 10 years at Texas Instruments in Dallas. I'm sure I could have helped some organizations. It just wasn't, my mind wasn't saying, oh, how do I go out and help organizations? I was just being a young guy, like having a good time. Um, but I could have started that a little bit more, uh, leaned in. And even once I got in, I think being a little bit more open to opportunities, like I said, eh, an audit committee, why would I join an audit committee? And it was one of the best committee experiences uh, that, I've, that I've had. And so, uh, so that's sort of it, leaning in a little bit more, being more open and starting, starting sooner, recognizing that you can do some of these things a lot you know, earlier. And especially now as we're in the digital age, social media, marketing, different things, you know, some of our like MIT 10 folk would be great on some of these, these, especially nonprofit boards. They just would bring a whole, like almost just through osmosis, just the way, you know, especially you find an older nonprofit, you come in. But I think I saw a message in there. Sometimes you, you can't buck them too, you know, too fast because they're not going to maybe move that quickly. But if you can add a few insights, uh, it can be, you know, a game changer. Thank you so much. Well, um, we are just at the end of our time tonight. Um, I really wanna thank Natalie and Carrie for all they had to share and being so generous with your stories and your advice. Uh, thank you all for your really great questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all tonight, um, but please do uh, keep a lookout for a survey that'll be in your inbox after the event so that we can continue to plan uh, programming that will be meaningful to all of you. So thank you so much and have a great evening. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.